we all know that uh, uh, computers and IT industry has reshaped our civilization. Uh, currently, we cannot speak, think of uh, maybe a moment without them. But currently, uh, as we all, as as time progresses, uh, the uh, inventions or whatever you say has reached a peak in some cases, like simulations and other uh, regions. Uh, the ideas of the during past uh, past century, the ideas of Turing machine has reached its peak. So that that came to the realization of Richard Feynman as well in the late 1970s. So Richard Feynman thought that if uh, our machines, like our Turing machines, are so uh, inaccurate in simulating a small system like an oxygen atom where uh, nature is doing it all the time so it bugged this question bugged him so he was thinking and then he came up with an idea what if we introduce the ideas of quantum mechanics in the quantum uh, in the turing machine re re regime so what he did was uh, then came the idea of quantum Turing machines and what we currently call it quantum computers. So from the inspiration of Richard Feynman, so, uh, Duncan Deutsch, then Joseph and other peoples like Peter Shor have distinctly shown the quantum advantage in the blackboard. But uh, but the in the blackboard is not the only way the science works. We all know that we have to see a live demo of it, right? That is what we believe in science, like uh, of the experiments and observations, and it has to match the theory. That is what is science is. So, uh, so we all know the current uh, quant. Uh, we all know the promise that the quantum uh, technologies are offering. So. Every country, every country develop in developed country mainly U.S., China, Russia, Australia, Europe. Everyone is trying to reach the quantum supremacy because uh, ev a lot of things are currently standing on the, uh, a lot of things like our banking, our internet, the RSA security, and what you name it. It's currently in the encryption uh, algorithm is based on RSA. Uh, I forgot the code so that uh, our encryption algorithm will be absolute if a quantum supremacy is achieved so so there has been there is a quest to reach quantum supremacy so whoever reaches first is the one is going to dominate the next years to come so uh we all need a realization of a full scale quantum computing so so that we can see the demos all the algorithms or whatever has been shown in the blackboard it it works so so which has been a tough nut to crack as well because we all know that uh, quantum systems are some of the systems or the some of the designs that ha currently exists are highly unstable they easily correlate with nature and give off their information and so we do not, we cannot do useful uh, computations. So I can go on and on, but I don't want to continue with the PBS special. So I will go straight to our uh, speaker of the day. Our speaker is our very own Dr. Mushita Masud uh, Munia Apu. She has graduated from uh, electrical and electronics engineering from WIT on 2018. She completed her PhD uh, in physics in 2019 from University of New South Wales. Currently, she is doing a postdoc in the same university. So, Apu, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Give me a second to share my slides. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, um, and uh, hello to everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about multi-scale modeling of donor qubits in silicon. So, as Riaz rightly said, that um, the quantum era is coming, and we all have to be well equipped for that as well in terms of experiments and theory and in all aspects. 
So I will try my best to keep this talk very general for so that everyone can follow. But if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out in the chat or you can even reach out to me separately even. So um, let's start. So I have uh, outlined today's talk in um, three different parts. So first I will talk about a little bit of motivation on quantum computing and uh, qubits and what they are and how they work and what is the state of art um, in this field basically. And then uh, in part two, I will talk about uh, donor quantum dots in silicon, which is uh, the system that uh, my research is based on. And then part three will be about how we can model these systems atomistically and uh, what outputs can we get through this modeling and how the modeling can help the future generation of quantum devices. So the quantum computing, uh, basically the idea started from Richard Feynman uh, in 1981. There was a conference on simulating physics with computers where he talked about that, can we simulate our uh, physical systems using the quantum properties? Because nature is fundamentally quantum. And if we want to capture all the properties of um, let's say condensed matter physics and many body physics, we need the need to use the quantum properties of the system. So the main idea of quantum computing is quantum simulation, which means to emulate the effective many body theory of the system that is beyond the reach of classical computers. Because classical computers can solve the electronic structure problems, let's say, but that's highly limited to the number of particles it can solve. If you increase the number of particles of the system, then it becomes exponentially hard to solve that system. So in this figure, what I'm showing is that when you have a lot of particles and a lot of um, sites that the particles can be, then there's lots of combinations that the particles can be in the system. It can either be uh, disordered like this. It can also be uh, ordered like the right figure. So depending on how the environment is, the combination is a lot. For a n spin half particles, you will need to have two to the power n combinations of these particles being in the system. So that means you will need to store at least two to the power n informations in your computation, which is extremely hard. So let's say we have 30 particles over here. That means we would need two to the power 30 information stored and we will need to calculate and process with these two to the power 30 uh, informations, which is extremely hard. So that's where uh, quantum simulators can help where they kind of replicate the properties or replicate the behavior of a system that is many body in nature and that cannot be simulated by using any classical computers. So using the uh, quantum simulation, we can solve many interesting problems that we cannot by classical computers, like the quantum phase transition of large particles, quantum magnetism, and high temperature superconductivity, to name a few. There are many more applications. But uh, to really become useful, we also need to do quantum computing using quantum algorithms. So. Um, there are many known quantum algorithms like uh, Shor's algorithm for prime factorization, which is um, using classical algorithms, you cannot reach beyond a number, which quantum computing or using quantum algorithms, you can easily reach. So the motivation of quantum computing doesn't need um, so much introduction or so, doesn't need so many informations. It's inevitable that it is going to be very, very important in the near future. But also it comes up with a lot of misconceptions because people think that quantum computer is just a fast computer, but it's, it's not actually that. Because the classical computer runs on completely different uh, methodology or phenomena, whereas quantum computers behave completely different. And their fundamental uh, 
bit system or information encoding system is completely different. So let's talk about how we encode information in quantum computers. So analogous to classical bit where we represent zero and one in a transistor, quantum computers has qubits. And a qubit is basically a two level quantum system using two orthogonal basis sets. Let's say uh, one of my bases is state zero and my another basis is state one. So this is a quantum two level system, which is orthogonal. And we can represent this uh, qubit using a block sphere. And our quantum state can be represented by using this equation where our wave function can be represented or the state can be represented as alpha zero plus beta one. Whereas alpha and beta are the coefficients of the state being zero and state being one. And depending on what is the value of these coefficients, our state can be anywhere in this block sphere. And if you uh, try to make an analogy with um, classical bit, then you would only see this line which goes from zero to one. Whereas in qubits, we have a block sphere uh, to operate our uh, qubit on. So in the right, I'm showing some states, uh, qubit states, depending on these coefficients, basically. So when the state is pointing in the zero direction, this is a zero state. And when this state is pointing towards this plus direction, this is basically a superposition of zero and one. So, which actually means that if you measure this state, 50% of the time you will get a zero and 50% of the time you will get a one. And so on. Basically it can be anywhere in this block sphere and depending on where it is, you can represent this in the basis of zero and one by just changing this coefficients alpha and beta. And of course, if you want to do some meaningful computations, you need to modulate this state. So you have to have some mechanism where you can easily transfer this zero state to one state and one state to zero state. So basically you need to travel everywhere uh, in the block sphere. So we need, we call these single qubit gates where we take one state and kind of modulate it. For example, this first figure is basically an X gate where um, the qubit is rotating with respect to the, around the x-axis. And the next one is rotating along the y-axis, a y-gate, and this one is rotating in the, uh, around the z-axis, calling, um, and this is called a z-gate. So there are many, many single qubit gates like that, which are use, useful for the single qubit operations. And, uh, like any gates in classical, uh, let's say digital computing, you have a um, single qubit gate, let's say not gate, uh, which uses one bit, and um, then you can flip that bit accordingly. Like if it's a zero input, then you can get one, and if it's a one input, then you can get zero. Similarly, using single qubits as well, you have to do this sort of operations and this sort of gate to do some meaningful computations. And of course, we also have to do some two qubit gate operations. For example, in uh, digital computing, we have AND gates, OR gates, and NAND gates. These are the fundamental gate sets that uh, build our computers, our transistors. And uh, so in quantum computing as well, we need to have the two qubit gate capability. For example, um, over here, I'm showing a C0 gate where depending on the state of the first qubit or the control qubit, the target qubit can be changed. So this C0 gate operates, uh, and the C0 gate flips the target qubit when the control qubit is uh, pointing in this direction, pointing in the negative z direction. So in the first case where you see that when both uh, the control qubit and target qubit are pointing up, the output is the same. It does nothing to the target qubit. Whereas when the control qubit is pointing to the z direction, it flips the target qubit. So this is a two qubit gate. And for any useful computation, there are many, many other two qubit gates like that, uh, like uh, swap gate, Hadamard gate, and a, a lot of many more as well. So you, in any kind of computation, you need these single qubit and two qubit gates as the basis. 
So let's talk about some different qubit platforms and how, what can be used as qubits basically. So if I have to mention uh, some major qubit platforms, one of them is superconducting qubit, which is uh, uh, very uh, recent and in, in the news, it, um, it's kind of flooding the news with uh, Google and IBM launching their superconducting qubits and their quantum processors. So in the superconducting qubits, uh, platforms mainly use charge qubit, phase qubit, or flux qubit. So um, I'm not going into too much details, but uh, I'm just trying to show the state of the art of the platform. For example, Google has launched a Sycamore processor to achieve quantum supremacy, which has 53 qubits operating. And using that, uh, they have claimed that they can do some operations that is beyond the reach of classical computers. Similarly, IBM is also interested in superconducting qubits and they have released their Eagle quantum processor, which has 127 qubits. Uh, not just this, uh, we can also use photons as qubits, whereas uh, different polarization of the photon can be used as the qubit states. For example, we can polarize the light in a horizontal uh, way or in a vertical way. And depending on if it is in horizontal state or vertical state, it can be used as a qubit. And this um, has been used extensively by uh, China and they have released their photonic quantum computers very recently uh, using um, the boson sampling method basically. Um, Again, I'm not going into too much details. I just wanted to give an uh, overview of what people are doing and what is interesting for them. And uh, using uh, Borealis, Janadu has also shown quantum supremacy and solved some problems that classical computers have not been uh, able to achieve. And the next one will be the semiconductor spin qubits. So this is what we are going to talk about the most today because um, uh, this is also the area of my research. And uh, why the semiconductor spin qubits are interesting to people is because semiconductor industry is um, almost uh, more than 50 year industry. And they have very advanced techniques, advanced mechanisms that are running for a long, long time. So people are very much into the semiconductor systems because they understand these systems in a, uh, for a long, long time and um, they have the capability to build up these systems. So in semiconductors, usually uh, what is used as qubits is the spin of electron or spin of the nucleus. So we, we know that uh, the spin of an electron or spin is, um, uh, so it's a, it's a quantum property of the system and it can, depending on the state it is in, we can use it as a qubit. So in the condensed matter system, when the, we apply no magnetic field, basically these upspin and downspin states are degenerate. But if you apply a magnetic field in the system, then this energy starts to split and um, the, spin down state becomes the ground state and spin up state becomes the higher state. And there is a, a gap between these two states. And basically we can use this two level system as our qubit. And depending on this method, a lot of proposals over the years has come which use these spin properties as qubits. For example, in 19, late 1990s, there was a proposal from Los Divincenzo, which is a very popular proposal where they have created using gates, metal gates, they have uh, created a quantum dot. And these quantum dots can basically trap electrons. And these electron spins can then be modulated using this um, gate set. And the electron spins can be used as qubits. Uh, there was another proposal from 1998 by Bruce Kane, who proposed that we can use individual donor atoms 
as uh, quantum dots because the donor atoms has coulomb potential that can bind electrons into it and using these gates uh, you can control how much electron will be in the donor and how much overlap of this wave function will be in between but the issue of this proposal is it's not very easy to place one phosphorus atom over here and one phosphorus atom over here just uh, in 20 nanometer separation because placing one individual atom is not something that people had discovered by then. So while this proposal was also very uh, appealing because uh, compared to these quantum dots, these donor systems are more con confined. So when the systems are more confined, they interact less with the environment. And if they interact less with the environment, that means they have less probability of decohering. By decohering, I mean, for example, let's say we want to encode our information into this uh, spin up system. But if this system, uh, if this state is interacting with the environment, then it will, after some time, it will relax and um, into the ground state, which will be the spin down state. So you will kind of lose your information. So while the quantum states are useful for quantum operations, they are also very fragile because they very easily interact with the environment and uh, lose the coherence basically. So if you keep the information over there and it interacts with the environment, then you will basically lose that information and cannot do anything useful with it. So when we are building the platform, we'll also have to keep into mind a system that can retain that coherence or retain that information. So, um, and uh, using semiconductor spin qubits, uh, Intel is working on it and they have recently, in this year, they have launched their 12 qubit system, which is called Tunnel Falls. And uh, many more research and many more work is going on in this direction. So, today I will talk a bit more on phosphorus donors in silicon because this is the platform that uh, we have chosen. Uh, the company that I work with, Silicon Quantum Computing. So their main uh, platform for quantum computer is phosphorus donors in silicon. So as Kane's proposal is very appealing, as I said that it was not very uh, possible for them to yet put one phosphorus donor um, deterministically into a silicon lattice, because that is a very hard thing to do to manipulate a single atom. But while that is impossible, um, let me go back a little bit. While that is impossible, this phosphorus donors in silicon also comes with very nice properties. For example, when you put a phosphorus donor, which is um, indicated by this red sphere in this lattice, this is a unit cell of silicon, and you, when you put a phosphorus donor over here, it basically replaces a silicon atom. And because phosphorus has one extra proton and electron than uh, one extra proton than silicon, that means there's one bond that is available, and that can bind one electron onto it. And that electron spin can be basically used the qubit. So it's kind of equivalent to a hydrogen atom in vacuum because uh, it's just one extra proton in the system. And because of this strong Coulomb potential, we also get higher coherence time. So in 2012, there was a remarkable advancement in the technology where using STM hydrogen lithography, it, uh, researchers has been able to put one phosphorus donor in the middle of the silicon lattice. So over here, we, uh, you can see in this picture, there is actually one uh, phosphorus atom sitting in the middle of this source and drain electrodes. So this was actually very remarkable progress and it meant that it's um, getting one step closer towards achieving uh, this uh, quantum computer proposal 
which involved this precision placement of the donor atoms. So in the right, I'm just showing a small uh, schematic of how the process works. So first, a silicon is grown, which is uh, indicated by these gray um, spheres. So after the silicon is grown, hydrogen atoms are put on top of it. And then using a STM tip, individual hydrogen atoms are displaced from this, uh, from the top. And after that, phosphine gas is dosed into the system, which contains these phosphorus atoms. And these phosphorus atoms basically take those empty spots that were prepared by this STM tip. And after that, again, these hydrogens are removed and silicon is grown on top. So that is how you get limited amount of phosphorus in the middle of a silicon lattice. So in this case, they had placed, uh, they had removed this one hydrogen atom from over here and deposited this phosphine gas, which uh, integrated one phosphorus atom in the middle of the silicon lattice. So this was actually very promising. So soon afterwards, uh, there was another group that uh, did a similar technique to implant one phosphorus atom in the silicon. And using surface gate, they were able to manipulate that single electron spin. So over here in this figure, you can see that there is a single spin sitting over here. And using a magnetic pulse, you can manipulate this spin. So the, how the manipulation of the spin works is that depending on what the spin of the nucleus is, the electron spin can be flipped. So in this energy diagram, you can see that there are four possible combination of the states for electron spin and nuclear spin. So this one is when the nuclear spin is down, nuclear spin is down spin, and there is one energy at which this electron spin can be flipped from the down spin to up spin. So basically in this energy scale, you can uh, also translate this energy to a frequency. And using that frequency microwave pulse, you can flip this spin from down spin to up spin. In similar way, when the nuclear spin is up, there is another frequency where you can flip this downspin electron to upspin electron. So this is a single qubit operation for the electron spins, depending on what the state of the nu um, nuclear spin is. So they had shown that uh, using this microwave pulse, you can control these uh, qubit states basically. So this is uh, the spin up fraction of the spin property. So you can see from zero, it reaches up to 0.4 and then it comes down and it oscillates until some time. So that means that you can basically change the rotation of the spin using this microwave pulse. So that's kind of gives you the single qubit operation of the system. And then you also, um, in 2018, it was also shown that you can address the individual spins of the system. So in the left, I'm showing you um, STM image of the device where 2P meaning two phosphorus atoms are placed over here in this left sphere and uh, one phosphorus atom is placed in the right. And so the right one shows that in the 1p, 1p dot, where there is just one single phosphorus atom, you have the, again these uh, two transitions where depending on the state of the nuclear spin down, you can flip the electron spin. So it was shown that at this frequency, you can, uh, when the nuclear spin is pointing downwards, you can flip one electron. This is um, the electron spin resonance. And also there is another resonance when the nuclear spin is pointing up. And in the 2P case, 
because there is just two nuclear spins now that means there are four possible transitions depending on what the nuclear spin state is and in this uh, figure you can show uh, you can see that there are different peaks but ideally there should have been four peaks but the middle peaks are degenerated energy so they are kind of um, smudged together so we cannot see them separately but uh, we can see the other peaks so this basically means that you can access the individual spin of the system and flip the electron spin so it basically shows that you have two donors in the left dot and one donor in the right dot and you can do some operations using these spins so then in 2019 so the same group has they have shown the two qubit swap gate using these donor quantum dots so in the left dot they have they again have uh, in this one, in this device, they had in the left dot, they had three phosphorus donors and in the right dot, they have two phosphorus donors. And using the interaction between these donors, they performed this swap operation. So how this works is when you have two spins and they are detuned, so over here in the left bottom plot, uh, you can see that there are different spin states. And at some point, uh, these states are degenerate. But as you keep detuning the device, by detuning, I mean you can tilt the two dots. And at some point of the detuning, you can turn their interaction on. So the two electrons can interact with the, each other by the exchange interaction and when that in, that happens the spins basically start to rotate between themselves so in this block sphere representation you can see that on the top i'm showing the up down state and in the bottom i'm showing the down up state so if i consider the, the top one to be zero and the bottom one to be one and i turn this exchange interaction which is uh, indicated via this black arrow my spins will start to rotate around this uh, axis so that means in the blocks here you can go from up to down when you turn this interaction on so which is uh, what was seen in the device and in the right you can see that uh, if you look at the blue and red curve depending on what your initial state of the system is, you can see that either it's down up or up down, you can see that they are kind of swapping between themselves and they are oscillating because of this exchange interaction being turned on. So by using this oscillation, you can actually uh, decide what to do with these pins. You can either flip their states when you reach over here. So if you, pulse this or turn this interaction for this amount of time, you will reach over here and the red one will reach over here. That means a complete swap operation of this spin state has been done. But if you don't want to do swap operation, you can also, uh, if you apply the pulse for a less amount of time, then you can also reach this root over swap operation, which is over here. And you can also do swap square operation where it interchanges the information and again uh, it reaches the same point. So what I'm trying to say with this is that using the donor qubits, donor electron spins as qubits, you can uh, do some single qubit operations and two qubit oper operations, which are the uh, most fundamental requirements of any computation. So now let's move on to the topic of modeling this, these systems, because you can imagine that, that putting two phosphorus atoms or one phosphorus atom precisely into a system is not that easy. It's a very sophisticated process and it also takes a lot of time. So of course, for doing some, um, gathering some information of the how the system behaves 
and how should you build your qubits, you have to do some modeling of these devices. But if you look closely at the system, there are lots of different components of this system. Over here, you can see that there is a source and there is a drain, and there are also multiple electrodes that uh, are in the system. And you have to kind of include the effect of everything separately as well, and also bring everything together. So the main parts of this system is the highly doped electrodes that are colored here in red. And uh, these are highly doped in phosphorus. So usually when we use in the transistor system, we also dope the system a little bit. Doping meaning that I'm introducing a lot of impurities over there that helps the conduction. And in these systems as well, similarly, these electrodes are formed by highly doping this silicon with phosphorus atom. And these are so highly doped that in every four silicon atom, there is one phosphorus atom. That is very high concentration. And this very high concentration actually makes these uh, electrodes metallic. So these are basically silicon, but on top of it, you put lots and lots of phosphorus. So they become highly metallic systems. And also you can see there is uh, these gaps in between, which we called tunnel junctions, where electrons can tunnel from here to here. So you also need to have an idea of how much this gap should be, how wide your electrode should be, and how much tunneling current can pass through here. And then there's, of course, you have to analyze these donor quantum dots as well where you have this individual phosphorus atom changing the properties of silicon severely. So basically what I'm trying to say is modeling these systems are challenging and it requires um, integrating different components together. So let's talk about some simulation methods that has been used over the years for simulating different systems. So one method is the top-down method, where which is used uh, mainly for large-scale systems, which are semi-classical simulations comprising of um, drift diffusion model or Boltzmann transport equation. And they work very well in uh, large-scale systems, especially in micrometer length scales. They work very well. And they are uh, well established for a long, long time. But the problem with these are they fail to capture the atomistic nature of these donor systems or atomistic um, nature of these small scale systems. And then there's another approach which is called the bottom up approach that includes the ab initio simulations. They are mainly uh, also something like the density functional theories which use no parameters, but at the same time, they are extremely hard to scale up because they are very limited by the number of atoms they can simulate. There is actually a very nice um, tutorial in this um, YouTube channel, and you can see that how complicated the simulation process or simulation domain of this density functional theory simulations are. So that is also not suitable for us because we need to solve large scale systems in terms of um, not so large that they are micrometer, but not so small that we can only simulate maybe, let's say, 1,000 atoms. But we have to be capturing the atomistic informations as well, but we need to also include these gates and tunnel junctions and every component of the device together. So there is another method, which is the intermediate one, where you can use effective mass approximation or empirical tight binding method. They have lots of benefit in terms of they also capture the quantum phenomena, especially if you are considering atomistic tight binding method, they consider the full description at the atomic scale. 
and they allow you to simulate multi-million atoms. And you can also include uh, electric field, magnetic field, and this kind of environmental properties into the simulations as well. But for doing this, you also need to, because they are empirical methods, you also need to um, determine the tight binding parameters beforehand doing some meaningful calculation using them. So let's talk about how the tight binding formalism works. So if we have uh, two atoms separated at a distance, then these two atoms will also have their own potentials. And then they, when they have the wave functions on top of them, then their wave functions will also overlap between each other. Depending on how much this wave function overlaps, you will have energy hybridization, which you can simply, very in a very simple Hamiltonian, you can present it like that, where the diagonal elements are like the self-energy of the system, and T is basically the tunnel coupling between these two, uh, two dots, basically. And depending on this energy hybridization, there is bonding and antibonding state formation, uh, which is the base of this tight binding formalism. So if you are considering each atomic orbital separately, then there's there will be like s orbital p orbital and this s and p orbitals will be will overlap with each other differently and create these bonding anti bonding states so basically it's very important for us to know how much these orbitals overlap with each other and depending on if they are s orbital p orbital and depending on their symmetry they will overlap with each other differently and if you are in a crystal structure where every atom is, um, for example, in the silicon structure, the nearest neighbor atoms are at an angle. So you also need to know how much the overlap happens at an arbitrary angle. And depending on that, you can formulate some parameters that kind of um, explains this overlap of these orbitals properly. So over here, I'm just showing sample um, parameters that. Uh, has been used for silicon. And how these parameters are determined is that you kind of um, use these empirical parameters and see if they can replicate the band structure of the material properly or not. So when you have these parameters and the overlap parameters uh, with you, then you can construct a tight binding Hamiltonian. For example, over here, I'm just showing a sample Hamiltonian where you have the self energy in the diagonals and all the overlap parameters in the off diagonal terms. So if you solve this Hamiltonian, you will also see the band structure of the material. And the, that band structure can also be calculated uh, or measured by experiments. And then you can uh, benchmark these two methods together and decide on what parameters best describes this material. So for sil because silicon has been used in the uh, semiconductor industry for a long, long time, the tight binding parameters of silicon is also well established. And in, we use a modeling tool, nanoelectronic modeling tool, tool, NEMO, to model silicon band structure. And because silicon is also, um, to some extent complicated material in that sense that it has an indirect band gap, meaning that its conduction band minima is not at um, zero K point, but at a uh, 0.85 K naught. So it's an indirect band gap material. And also it has a conduction band degeneracy of six. So that means uh, in bulk silicon, the conduction band state sticks states are degenerate of different valley compositions. But when you insert a donor into the system, it kind of lifts this degeneracy. And this donor uh, splits this six-fold degeneracy into one, two, one, three, and two-fold degeneracy. And we are mainly interested into the lowest state because we want a two-level system for our qubit. And this one is state, this is an orbital state. So the spin state will be um, again split by two when we apply a magnetic field over here. 
and then we can use this lowest state as our qubit. So in our modeling tool, what we do is we have lots of um, silicon atoms in our system. So this is a box size of 30 nanometer where these green dots are all silicon atoms and all these atoms are described by the self energy of their orbitals and how the orbitals uh, interact with each other. So in a box where uh, the domain is 30 nanometers, the number of atoms that we have is almost 1.3 million. And this is a very large scale system to solve because when you uh, solve this system, because we are using a 20 band model, that means every atom is being described by 20 parameters, kind of like 20 orbital and how uh, these orbitals also interact with each other and how these also near uh, uh, atoms interact with the nearest neighbor atoms as well. So that means that if I have 1.3 million atoms in my system, that means the simulation problem that I need to solve or the Hamiltonian that I need to solve is basically 20 million. And the Hamiltonian that I need to solve becomes 20 million by 20 million, which is a very large scale problem to solve already. And for to solve this system, we need very highly efficient algorithms and parallelized algorithms that can use the multiple processors at the same time. So to do that, we use a supercomputer that is in um, uh, under the National Computational Infrastructure in Australia. This is called GADI. And uh, this supercomputer uh, helps us use multiple processors at the same time to calculate uh, this system, these large scale systems. And in the modeling tool, there's lots of different features, like you can simulate any number of donors, any number of electrons, and uh, you can use, um, you can see the effect of electric field, magnetic field, and also you can simulate the quantum dots as well. So basically um, this modeling tool gives us access to see what these donor quantum dots uh, behave like when they are put at different separation, different directions and different, um, you know, in different number of donors. But still there's lots of uh, other modeling uh, bits that needs to be done. For example, if you want to solve these highly doped leads atomistically and the entire device altogether, that's actually not practical. Because I just showed that for a 30 nanometer box, you already have a problem, 20, million, uh, 20 million by 20 million. So if you uh, want to include everything altogether, that will be impossible to do so. So what we do over here is that we try to break this problem down into smaller problems. For example, this leads that are highly doped, we can consider them actually as a separate system and look deep into it that what's happening in the leads. And to model these highly doped electrodes, what we do is we take a small strip of silicon atoms and we put a few phosphorus donors over here and we put them exactly how it's patterned in the STM. It's one phosphorus atom in every four silicon atom. So we construct this system and we can consider them as uh, periodic systems because these leads are actually very long in dimensions. So if we consider them periodic, that helps us reduce the computational complexity of our system. But at the same time, it also gives us the atomistic properties that comes from this highly uh, high doping. So what we do over here is that we solve the atomistic tight binding Schrodinger equation. So we form this um, Hamiltonian of this system using the tight binding parameters. And then we solve the electron density of the system. Then from using the electron density, we can 
uh, solve the hard tree potential of the system and also the exchange correlation potential of the system. And this potential is again fed back into the Schrodinger equation. So we solve this self consistently until the simulations converge and the output is the band structure of the system. So this band structure is actually very interesting to look at in the sense that this is plotted uh, with respect to the bulk silicon conduction bands. And you can see that below the conduction band of bulk silicon, there's many, many bands that's coming because of these impurities uh, being here. So what is happening is that these bands are coming into the band gap of silicon and reducing the band gap of silicon. So the more band gap it reduces, it becomes more metallic. Because when you have higher band gap, the material acts as an insulator. But when you have less band gap, the material acts as metal, more like metals. So from these simulations, we get the information that how much, how many bands are below this uh, bulk silicon and what is the Fermi level of the system. And we can see that the Fermi level of this system is actually well below the bulk silicon conduction band minima. And we use this information and we use this insights into understanding what geometry of these electrodes will be useful for us or will be beneficial for us. So this was just about understanding the electrodes separately, but that is not all. We still have to understand what is the total electrostatic potential of the device. Because the donor quantum dots will be in the middle of these gates, and we have to understand how these gates change these donor quantum dot states. And we also have to have that control over this system. So what we see in the right is that when this, um, there is only one atom in the center. And in this case, in the left, you can see that there is no electron in the system. So this is uh, called D plus state where there is no electron, it's just uh, empty Coulomb potential of the donor. And then at some point, one electron is introduced over here. You can see that this is a peak of current. That means one charge has moved into the dot. And then again, then nothing happens. And after this point, there is another electron that comes into the system. So that means when you are applying these gate biases, you are kind of tuning this system such that electrons can enter into the system. So this is actually an experimentally measurable quantity. And this is very important to understand like at what bias you can introduce and um, electrons into the system. So to solve the whole electrostatic, what we do is first we solve the, uh, first we solve the properties of the gates separately, as I have shown by using the Schrodinger and Poisson equation self-consistently. But then we use these properties in our nonlinear Poisson solver, which includes the whole domain of the system. This is not atomistic anymore because atomistically you cannot solve these large scale systems. So we use a semi-classical Poisson solver that can give us this large scale but at the same time, it kind of retains these informations from the atomistic systems. And after doing this, we can solve the entire electrostatic uh, potential of the device under different gate biases. And in the down right, what I'm showing here is that by applying gate biases, you can see that the energy state of the system is going down. And I am indicating here two transition, which indicates that at this bias point, one electron is getting into the system. And at this transition, another electron is getting into the system. And these results actually match very well with the experimental results that they had for this device. That makes us believe that the methodology that we are taking by 
breaking the problem into smaller problems and then bringing every, everything together actually works very well in this regime. And this can uh, give us some valuable information on how to design these systems. So then the next problem we are trying to tackle here is solving the tunnel junction problem. Where we have two electrodes, again, they are very highly doped leads and there is a gap in the middle. And we want to see how much um, current can tunnel through this system. And to solve this, we again need the entire electrostatic of the system because we need to understand what is the electrostatic potential in this source and drain and what is the potential in the channel. Because that will decide how much electron can tunnel from source to drain. And to solve this problem, we First, calculate the entire electrostatic of the system by using, again, breaking up this problem into small gates and then using those information to calculate the entire electrostatics. And then we input this electrostatic potential into a transport equation, which is our atomistic tight binding NEGF method. And this is also a very large scale simulations because you can see that uh, in the Grimm's functions formalism, there is the need or where you have to invert this matrix. And computationally inverting a matrix is very expensive and very difficult and time consuming. So using the high performance computers like the supercomputer, we were able to solve this transport problem uh, where electrons tunnel from source to drain. And over here, I'm showing some results. Uh, so you can see that the blue curve is from uh, effective mass model where the uh, silicon bands are basically represented by one effective mass, which is not very correct representation of the system because we saw in the band structure that there are different bands coming to play in these systems, which needs to be specifically taken care of. And the red plot is the atomistic um, model that we are solving. And over here, I'm also showing the experimental results that were obtained uh, from these devices. And this red plot actually, red dots actually match very well with the results that we got. So again, we had have gained very good experimental agreement between using our model and the measurements. So using this, multi, uh, uh, using this modeling tool, NEMO, we can also simulate multi-electron systems. But multi-electron systems are always a challenge to solve because uh, when you are solving a single particle Schrodinger equation, you don't need to consider the electron-electron interactions because there's only one electron in the system. But as soon as multiple electron gets into the system, the, uh, the Hamiltonian and the interaction taking into account becomes really difficult because you have to consider all the interaction that is possible between different orbitals. So, but using this uh, modeling tool HEMO, uh, there was this nice results were published in 2016 where they have shown the exchange coupling of two donors. So in this plot, you can see that there is the exchange coupling that is plot, plotted against separation. That means when you bring these two dots closer, they have very high interaction between them. And when you take them further, their interaction kind of decreases. If you remember, uh, we discussed the two qubit gates where we need this interaction to be strong to rotate the spin states between them. So one thing is that for these donor systems, if you take them further than, uh, let's say 10 nanometer, their interaction becomes so weak that you cannot do any operations with them. But you also need to do two things. One, you need to have a strong interaction. And another one is that you need to be able to control that interaction. By applying, let's say, gate biases, you can turn this interaction on when you want to, the spins to rotate. And you can also turn the interaction off when you don't want the spins to rotate. But by doing some modeling, it was wonderfully shown that when you have a symmetric system in the right plot, when you have a symmetric system of 
one phosphorus donor in one dot and one phosphorus donor in another dot. You see that you cannot really tune this interaction a lot. The plots are relatively flatter. But if you look at this pink curve over here, you can see that when you have a two phosphorus donor in one dot and one phosphorus donor in one dot, which means you have an asymmetric system, you can tune this interaction by many orders of magnitude. Almost five orders of magnitude tunability can be achieved in these systems. And actually the two qubit swap gate that I showed you was based on this modeling insight. That asymmetric system can be tuned to achieve high exchange. And this tunability is very important for turning on and off these qubit operations. So this was another very useful insight into the design criteria of these qubits. So the final result that I'm going to talk about is that using this modeling tool NEMO and using the uh, using a technique called full configuration interaction, which is used to solve the exact many body problem of multiple particles. What we have uh, seen is that when you have four donors in a chain, arranged in a chain, then you can increase this interaction many fold. So in this plot, I was showing that when you have, uh, when you take these donors a bit further, the interaction is kind of um, almost zero and you cannot do any useful operations between them. But that means that you always have to put these qubits very closer together to do anything useful with them. That kind of beats the purpose that you cannot do long range communication of information using these qubits. You can only transfer information up to 10 nanometers, which is very small. But is there any technique that uh, using that you can extend this separation? So in this uh, final results, what we show over here is that this red spins are basically our qubit. And in the middle, we put two spins as a mediator. What we see from this is that when you introduce these two mediator spins in the middle, that kind of mediates the exchange between this qubit and this qubit, which is actually three times further than they could be if there was no mediators in between. So in the right plot, what I'm showing is this blue curve, which shows that their exchange is very um, uh, decaying very fast when there is nothing in between. So this is the exchange between this Q1 and Q2 when there is nothing in the middle. Whereas the orange plot is showing that when you introduce these two things in the middle, their exchange dramatically increases. And you can also place them at larger separations. So where you were only limited up to, let's say 10 nanometer, now you can easily reach up to 30 nanometer and your exchange doesn't decay as much. So this was also a theoretical work that showed that, this is actually a very recent work that shows very wonderfully that um, how you can design these qubit systems so that you can benefit maximally out of this, which by only doing experiments, you won't be able to see or understand what's happening into the physics. So by that, I would like to summarize the talk by saying that um, the donor based devices are a very promising platform for quantum computing for many reasons, because they are, uh, they have longer coherence time. They use the silicon um, based uh, foundry knowledge, but this atomistic and sophisticated um, device also need to be supported by atomic scale modeling that can explain their behavior exactly. And we have shown some uh, results where we have developed a multi-scale modeling framework where we have integrated different modeling techniques together that can describe the behavior of these systems. And in many cases, we have achieved the agreement with the experiments. 
and we have proposed some efficient designs that can help the realization of efficient quantum computers. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Apu, for a wonderful and informative talk. So uh, I will, uh, let's, add, does anyone from the audience have any question? Uh, you can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat so that we can re read it out. So <clears throat> feel free. So there's one question in the chat, actually. So let me read, read out for you. Uh, can you shed some light over the, dif uh, over the difference between the third and the fourth case? Uh, I'm not sure which case are they talking about. Uh, which one is that? Uh, it was about the graph. Uh, can you be more specific? Which graph? Or you can unmute yourself if you if you don't have any issues. Uh, Plabon, I think. Uh, he's. Super exchange coupling between the spins. Uh, is it this one? Yes, yes. Third and the fourth case. Uh, the previous one. Uh, this one? Yeah, this one, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So the third and the fourth case. Oh, uh, so the difference between them is basically the separation between them. So um, when they are farther apart, the tunability is to some extent more because uh, you have more control over the wave function overlap between them. So when they are separated by 10 nanometers, the wave function control between the two dots are actually a bit limited because you cannot pull the wave function out from there. But when they are further separated, their wave function overlap is more loosely bound. So you can uh, easily pull out the wave function. So that, uh, so the exchange interaction basically comes from the, how much the over, uh, wave functions is overlapping. So if you can control the wave function, that gives you better tunability of the exchange coupling. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, okay, he's saying he has a uh, microphone issues, so I think he uh, uh, does. Does that answer your question, Plavun? Uh, oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, does anyone from the participant uh, have uh, having any questions or having anything not clear? Okay, someone's... Uh, from beginner, where should we start? Okay, uh, this one is a very good question. Uh, from beginner, from, uh, for beginners, from where should we start learning? Any books or review article recommendation out of three basic categories of simulation methods? Uh, what is the best suited for beginner? I think there's a two question. It's, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, he, he, Nafis is asking for resources. First of all, uh, okay. can you share some resources? Okay, so that's a very good question. For beginners, uh, it depends on what you want to learn. So um, if you want to learn about quantum computing, there's a very good book from Nielsen and Chuang. Uh, I forgot the name of it, but it's something called Quantum Computing and Quantum Information. That's a very good book where you can learn about quantum computing itself. But then if you are more interested into the simulation method and simulation techniques, so for the beginners, I think the tight binding Hamiltonian or tight binding simulations, but in limited scope where you can easily explain the Hamiltonian by using 
less number of parameters. For example, um, I am using a 20 band Hamiltonian, which makes the calculation extremely difficult, right? But then you can also use smaller scale problem to start with that you can easily solve in maybe MATLAB or Python. Uh, let's say the, uh, I think uh, some of the beginner type simulation would be solving graphene like systems where you have uh, only contribution from one orbital and then you can um, get some bench structure results and you can also do some calculations using those systems. So I would recommend the effective mass approximation or tight binding Hamiltonian, but in a, uh, in, you know, in a limited orbital settings, that would be useful. And if you want to learn more about those, there's a very good book from uh, Cardona and you on semiconductor fundamentals, which touches based on uh, the tight binding Hamiltonian and tight binding um, methodology. And also, there's also one very good book if you want to learn about tight binding Hamiltonians and NEGS specifically. That's by Shukriya Datta. And uh, it's called Atom to Transistor. So that's also has been very useful for me in the beginning. So I think you can follow those resources. Okay, so anyone else? Uh, okay, uh, then since I have some questions of my own as well. So uh, my first question would be in single qubit operation, I think you have showed us a, a, a configuration. You have showed us four configurations like uh, nuclear spins. Okay, okay. Uh, can you please uh, navigate to that slide in single qubit operations? Uh, is it this one? Yes, 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 exactly this one. Uh, uh, yeah, we, yeah you, here you, we, we can see we have four configurations, right? So don't yes. we have some uh, symmetry, anti-symmetry issues of the like poly exclusion principle here? Um, it's, um, are you talking about the symmetry and anti-symmetry of uh, nuclear and electron spins because these yeah, are yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Two, two different spins. Yeah. Mm, if the, the, uh, so that would be for identical particles, but nuclear spin and electron spins are not identical particles. So I don't think there will be exclusion principle applied to that. But if there mm. were two electron spins or two nuclear spins, then that would be, I think, important. But I'm, I'm not too sure how to explain that in this yeah. setting. Usually when we have a molecular configuration, we used to think like if we neglect the uh, core coarse atoms, uh, core, uh, what should I say, core positive ions, then we can just consider the only the electron wave functions like spatial distributions and spins. Uh, but if we consider like the nuclear as well, then they also contribute to the uh, asymmetry, anti-symmetry part. I'm if I'm not wrong. I mean, as as far as I understand, that would happen when you have two electron or two nuclear spins, because like as I'm showing over here, that's for two electrons, right? And yeah, yeah, when yeah. these two two spin states kind of come together, that's when you have this anti-symmetry issue. And there, then there's these oscillations coming because they form a uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric singlet and triplet states. And these states basically oscillates between themselves. Uh, okay. So that's where the, so that's where the anti-symmetry is basically where the exchange interaction comes from. Yes, yes. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think someone, I also have uh, some other questions as well, but uh, I there's someone in the chat has also, 
uh, put a question. Uh, okay, uh, he's removed it. Maybe he, he's rephrasing it. Okay, uh, then I have another question. Like, uh, uh, but in this system, like we, uh, what we have here is a um, dope. I think it's a donor qubit system. Uh, how prone is it to error? Like, say, how how is it not that much error prone? Or do we have to maintain certain temperatures, like what we have seen in superconducting yeah. systems? So, do yeah. we need temperature? Do so, we have temperature constraints here as well? Yes, definitely. So, all the quantum systems are subjected to thermal noise because when you are applying um, high temperatures, these quantum states will decohere and they will kind of, uh, because we always want the ground states to be the qubits, right? And we yes. want to preserve them as long as possible. So when w these experiments are actually done in millikelvin temperatures, which is like 100 millikelvin to preserve the spin states. Still, after some nanoseconds, these spin states decohere. That means you can imagine how fragile these are. Yes. But there are uh, different there are different noise mechanisms uh, or the decoherence mechanisms in different platforms. Like in superconducting qubits, it's something different, and is in this qubits, it's something different. For example, when you are um, using the quantum dots systems, which are formed which forms the quantum dots using the gates only, not by the donor. Donor over here has its own Coulomb potential, right? Which is very strong and deep. But when you are uh, making the quantum dot potential using the gates, they are very subjected to charge noise because there are lots of stray charges um, around and that mainly disturbs the qubit. But in the donor, because it's an isolated system in, in sense of strong Coulomb potential, it's kind of protected to some extent. But there's also other uh, decoherence mechanisms working in these qubits as well. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, then my final question would be, uh, like in super exchange systems, uh, like say in super exchange model, I think it's, it's the last slide. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, this one. I, I in super exchange, uh, you have introduced two mediators. Does this mediate? Uh, can we scale the mediators numbers? Like, say, well, how about we have, uh, five, seven, or some other numbers uh, rather than two. Ah, uh, so it always has to be an even number because there has to be a singlet formation of these mediators, so that they themselves don't interact with the qubits, and they don't disturb them. So if there is an unpaired electron, then it will not form a singlet and contribute to the exchange as well. So that in that way, we won't be able to distinguish the end qubits basically. But you can scale it up as two, four, and six mediators. But as you can see, as you um, increase the separations between the end qubits, the super exchange will decay for sure at some point, right? So that yes. won't be that useful as well. But if you want to scale it up, then you would have to add two more so they can form one more singlet between them. Uh, okay, then I ha I think I have a follow up. Like, why if we if even numbers are allowed, does that mean the mediators are entangled with each other? Yes, I mean singlet states are entangled states. Yeah, so I, they are like, entangled with each other. No, no, no. I'm talking about the mediators. Yeah, mediator states, mediator spins will form a singlet between them as well. Uh, okay, so okay. We, we want them to form a singlet so that the outer spins can form a singlet and triplet between them. So basically the exchange oscillation is between the singlet and triplet. Uh, okay. I'm not uh, sure if I'm making the point clear, but it's, uh, so it's basically we want these two spins to form a singlet and form a, Kind of like not do anything so that it doesn't disrupt the end qubits basically uh okay i uh that will be it from my side uh does anyone in the chat has any question uh, uh okay 
I think um, uh, there is no question in the chat. Uh, okay, and then thanks, thank you, Apu, again for a wonderful talk, and thanks to everyone in the chat. Uh, so, if anyone further has any question, um, he or she email Apu. I I think, <laughs> yeah, and also, sure, sure. Uh, and also, UNSW has a wonderful facility in quantum computing. If you haven't checked it out, you can maybe check out. Like I have checked out today, and it's really amazing. I think Apu can share some words about it. Yeah, so um, I would say in quantum computing, specifically in semiconductor spin qubits, the NSW is uh, well ahead, I would say. And they um, there's lots of work going on and lots of interesting uh, experiments and theoretical work going on. And there are also different startup companies that are coming up with quantum computing. So it's also kind of like commercial as well. So a lot of people and a lot of money is behind it. And uh, the government is also supporting the quantum computing uh, field a lot. So, and you know, it's it's quite hyped. So it's a, it's a good time to get into it as well. Indeed. Uh, okay. Uh, then if there's no further questions, so that will be it for today. Thank you everyone for, uh, everyone for joining. And thanks to our speaker as well for a wonderful talk. Thank you.